Dear, dear participants of the third executive model OIC online lectures, welcome on our next live stream session. I would like to greet you all on behalf of the Eurasian Regional Center of ICYF, and would like to remind you that this uh, project is being implemented by ICYF ERC in partnership with the Ministry of Youth and Sports of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Today, our guest is Dr. Professor Salman Sayed, uh, the professor at the University of Leeds and the author of the book of the Recalling the Caliphate. Uh, on behalf of the ICYF ERC, we would like to thank Professor for, expecting our, for accepting our invitation and joining us today. Uh, and uh, after, the, the, after the presentation, after the lecture of the uh, esteemed professor, you will have a chance to ask questions to uh, dear, our dear professor, and he will deliver a lecture about imagining Islamic aid futures today. So, professor, thanks for joining us today, and you, you, we may start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, imagining Islamic aid futures is the theme of this lecture, um, but I want to start like many. Um, Muslims are asked to do in searching of knowledge. I want to start in China. Around about 2000, um, about 10 years ago, the Chinese uh, government began to talk about a Chinese dream. It began to suggest that what people should be doing is thinking um, about China, not its actuality, but what does it mean to be Chinese? How can you project the ethos of the People's Republic in its current formation into the future? So what I would say is if you think of the Chinese dream, is a mixture of both um, domestic issues about prosperity, about becoming rich, but also as a global projection. It means that the project of the country is to stand for something more than just itself. Now, many of us have already heard about the phrase, the American dream. Um, often you hear American politicians, actors, uh, writers, commentators, journalists will often talk about the American dream. It is this idea of a particular sense of mixture of values and resources that projects what it means to be American, what it means to be America uh, forward. And the idea is this, that this American dream should be attractive to not just current Americans, but it acts as a beacon, as a, as a source of hope and inspiration for everyone across the world. So if the Americans have a dream, if the Chinese now have a dream, and that dreaming is part of them being a, a kind of globally engaged as being a global a force in the world which recognizes that being globally present doesn't just mean the hard power of um, military and economic might, but it also means the soft power of cultural um, aspirational elements which seek out. Then the question must be that if there is a Muslim global presence, is there a Islamic hate dream? Now, I say Islamic hate, not Islamic, because I want to make the distinction between um, what is Islam and what is inspired by Islam. In this, I'm following the work of um, suggestion of Marshall Hodgson, who distinguishes Islam and the Islamic hate. So you could say that there are you could argue that the only truly Islamic society was the one um, constructed at the time of the prophet, and after that you have variations of the Islamic hate, those that are inspired by Islam but are not reducible to Islam. 
So for example, you could say there's Islamic cake mathematics, which means there are mathematicians who may be inspired by the um, civilization and cultural built around, built through um, the venture of Islam, but not the same as being Islamic. So the question then is that, is there an Islamic hate dream right now? Or do we only have national dreams? Do we only have dreams which are borrowed? Do we actually dream at all? And surely if you are Muslims in different parts of the world suffering great deal of oppression um, from all different quarters, do you have the time to dream? So in many ways, you could think about dreaming as being a um, matter of emotion, a matter of um, the heart rather than the matter of the head. What I want to do is suggest to you that dreaming is actually not just an emotional exercise, but it's also an intellectual exercise. And then I want to go back to the question about the future and how uh, imagining the future and the importance of that. In the book, Recording the Caliphate, I make a distinction between clearing and dreaming. And the distinction is this, that academic work has two roles to play. One part is clearing. It's to dealing with criticisms. It's dealing with um, issues which prevent the ability to think of yourself in the future. So in other words, there's an element of clearing which is linked to critique. The idea of critique is crucial to the idea of clearing. And this critique can be um, at various levels. It can be critique of economic arrangements. It can be critique of social policy. It can be critique of many, many things. But critique itself can be of two types. Clearing or critique can be, on the one hand, its critique is rejection. It's based on denying something, um, simply disagreeing with something. Yeah. So if someone says X, you say no, it's not X. And that kind of critique, which is based on denial, often becomes basically um, focused on positivism, on empiricism. So the idea is this, that if I said to you, uh, here is a green glass of water, and you said, no, the glass is not green, it's actually made out of, it's blue. That would simply be a denial. The other part of critique is what's called undoing. And undoing is basically unraveling the assumptions which make an assertion possible rather than simply refuting the assertion. To give you another example, rather than um, saying, here's uh, one to give you a more practical example. Many Muslims in many parts of the world will often be confronted with something like this, that Islam is, um, Islam leads to terrorism. And the temptation is very strong to say, no, it does not lead to terrorism or no, it's not violent. And then what you have is a game of examples that one person would say, look, of course it's violent because this act was committed by this group and they are Muslims. And then you are in the position of saying, no, but what about this other group, which is does charity work, which is not violent, etc. But this kind of argument already concedes too much. It means that you are already at the level of trying to disprove or approve something that's already been said. So you have to now disprove that Islam is violent. But that means you've already accepted that there's a case to be made. So this argument then you are in the strategy of denial. The other way would be to simply say, to undo that assertion in the first place, to say that the judging of how you determine Islam and how you determine what is violence is actually 
the key to rather than saying whether uh, Islam is violent or not violent. Yeah. To give you an example, um, is it violent to be involved in national liberation struggles? Is it violent to be involved in to use violence to stop violence? Uh, it doesn't matter where you are on that threshold, what you believe, but what you're doing is no longer accepting the terms of that exchange. So you are actually questioning what it means to be violent, what it means to be Islam. Are you saying that rather than taking them for granted? So if critique is also undoing, it moves the argument to a different place. Now, once you start thinking of critique in those terms, you still realize that ultimately what critique is about is saying what is wrong. It is about delivering and explaining what is wrong with the situation today. What critique doesn't do, it doesn't um, necessarily create by itself an alternative vision or an alternative way of looking at things. It simply remains at the level of the present and without being able to say, okay, what is it that we can do to foster something new, to bring the new into the world? How do we look at things in a different way? In other words, critique is necessary for solutions, but in itself cannot provide solutions. Critique, it clears, it makes possible to think about solutions, but to actually think about to actually deliver on solutions, to actually imagine what a solution might be, means you have, is an act of imagination. You have to escape the present to think about what a solution might be. So in other words, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that clearing has to go in hand to hand with dreaming. It's to have go in hand to hand with thinking of an alternative. Now, as long as our imaginations for thinking the alternative are colonized, are constrained, we can never escape. However much of critique that we do, however much clearing we do, it will always be a non-ending, a never-ending task. Because what it doesn't do is build an alternative. To build an alternative requires an imagination that escapes the current situation. Okay, so, so far what I've said to you is I started off by talking about how two global powers of the day have started articulating themselves, one more recently than the other. Um, as have articulated a Chinese dream and an American dream. And the purpose of this dream then is not just to criticize uh, the current situation, but purpose of the dream is to project the future that everyone will be able to have dream the American dream or dream the Chinese dream. In a sense, that's one of the alternatives. So in this world where there are these possibilities of dreaming. Can there be other kinds of dreams? Can we dream or, ima or imagine a future which isn't the same as what has gone before? Okay, so that's the general proposition I want to uh, make. What contribution can um, academics make to the project of imagining a future. On the one hand, it's easy to say, well, actually, if you're talking about the Chinese dream or the American dream, the most important purveyors of that dream were not academics, but actually people 
artists of various kinds, um, movies. It was all the people who work in culture who basically took that dream and translated it and spread it through their works of art, through their cultural production. Um, and therefore, the really, the people who articulate or can spread the dreams are cultural workers, are workers of, with imagination, um, are artists. Now, if that is the case, then surely the answer would be that we should have Islamic hate cultural production. But in most cases, when we have seen the attempt to have a controlled cultural production, it's often been disappointing in its results. And it's often been simply replaying um, what has already happened. Now, what I want to suggest is this, that since the ending of colonialism and that formal colonialism, and that varied from the 1930s for in some cases to the 1890s in other cases, um, points in between, there was an attempt to imagine what would come after European colonialism. And many would say that in fact, much of those dreams and aspirations and hopes have been um, dashed, they have been uh, made, they've been made to look really sorrowful because the hopes were so great and the achievements have been so little. And this is a wider kind of narrative that circulates in which the sense of uh, colonial disappointment, decolonialization, disappointment, decolonization has become quite key. That in fact, there is no alternative to the way the world is. And what that then produces is a certain kind of attempt to imitate and to construct societies along the pattern of what has been considered to be successful in the past. Now, what I want to do here is talk a little bit about the phenomenon of Kemalism, which um, is named uh, after Mustafa Kemal, who became the ruler of what used to be the Ottoman Empire, it was basically uh, became Turkey and the founder of Turkey in, 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 in um, the Turkish Republic in 1924. And from the 1920s for about a decade, Mustafa Kemal introduced in, and his colleagues introduced a number of reforms that sought to transform Turkey into a society which they thought would be more European. And the reason why they did this is because they thought that history had demonstrated very clearly that European societies were better or more superior than non-European societies. So the idea was this, that if you wanted to uh, provide prosperity to your people, the way to do this would be by imitating um, Europe because they had succeeded in providing prosperity to their people. So they introduced reforms such as, for example, they moved the um, holiday from Friday to Sunday. They uh, abandoned the Arabic script in favor of the Latin script. They banned um, the hijab, they banned, um, they banned fez, the, the Turkish headgear, and um, they promoted 
uh, Western opera instead of traditional Turkish music, et cetera, et cetera. So they brought out all of these reforms. And the idea was this, that if you could make Turkey European in appearance, it would be able to compete better with uh, the rest of the world. It would be able to reproduce the success of Europe. Now, the reason why I mentioned Kemalism is because Kemalism was not a Turkish phenomenon. It was certainly an Islamic hate phenomenon. In other words, it was a phenomena which appeared throughout the Muslim um, lands, throughout Muslim areas, Muslim societies. Um, it appeared in Iran, it appeared in Afghanistan, all of these, that many of the regimes that began to um, take over as, as the colonial powers left, simply began to think, right, what we need to do is modernize and modernization meant westernization. And this became the founding template for most uh, post-independence Muslim societies. In fact, I would argue it became the majority view. Now, what Kamalism did then is translate what it understood as modernization into westernization and sought to westernize its society. In an effort to westernize its society, it had to understand its society through Western lens. Because a society could only be westernized, which was not Western, which was not modern, which was not uh, prosperous, which did not have all those positive qualities. So it had to reproduce the colonial gaze, which said that these societies are inferior. So it first had to accept and internalize that inferiority. Then it had to try and um, work through that, to work against it. Hence, its focus on reforms and on um, reforms that were kind of almost very basic. Why, what does it matter what headgear you wear, what, whether you wear a hat or a fez or a turban? How does that equate with your ability to um, build iron and steel? Why were certain cultural markers coming from the West seen to be necessary for self-development? Why was it seen that if you imitated the West, you would be able to, um, you would be able to uh, achieve the success of the West? And part of this was a reading, a reading of the West that was not um, That was not uh, I wouldn't say necessarily not true, but certainly that was self-serving. So one of the main narratives, Western narrative, was that modernity was rationality, and the absence of modernity was chaos and um, violence. Now, what that meant is that modernity and coloniality was presented as being two distinct things. The reality was this, that majority of the people on the planet, when they experienced modernity, they experienced it through colonialism, they experienced it through colonial controls, through colonial regulation and through colonial violence. So the idea that modernity was something uh, which was not violent, which was not violating, was simply 
a conceit of a particular type of narratives in which the colonial and the modern were separated, when the reality was that they were very much fused together. So what this meant for, um, and here I'm just focusing on Islamic, uh, Islamic societies, was that in nearly every single case, when European colonial um, took over Islamic societies, they took efforts to undermine indigenous um, productions of knowledge, indigenous activities. Um, they did this consistently and they didn't necessarily do it because they had anything against Islam per se, but that's, they did it because they were ultimately conquerors and did not want any resistance to that rule or any complication to that rule. So part of that was in that you've seen in societies in Muslim lands where you have basically, for example, a form of linguistic apartheid, where in some parts of the world you have um, societies which were colonized by English, you have the dominance of English, in others where you were colonized by the French, you have the dominance by the French, etc., um, the Dutch, so all of these kinds of different kind of uh, ways in which those who could speak the imperial colonial languages and those who couldn't, the literatures produced in them, the different kinds of privileging, all of these kind of effects were working. So colonialism, what I want to try and explain here, was not should not be understood as simply a economic or a military phenomenon. It always, always had a cultural aspect to it. It meant different kinds of values were given to different kinds of things. Okay, so Kamalism then began because Kamalism took place, which up to that point had been the strongest, most powerful, independent Muslim uh, political society at the time, its transformation of that society was felt all across the Muslim lands among Muslim societies, Muslim intellectuals, etc. So there were two things that I want to emphasize about Kamalism. One, Kamalism denied that being a Muslim should mean anything significant. It denied the idea that there was any kind of uh, Muslim um, sensibility or there was a Muslim, uh, Muslim societies which went beyond the boundaries of the nation state. It accepted the narrative of nationhood and the idea that all politics and all political um, life should be contained within the boundaries of a nation state. And that nation state should have no higher commitment or any higher ideal except its own interest. So you have this idea of the construction of nationalism. Now, what is interesting is again the uh, what that does is reproduce a narrative, um, a Eurocentric narrative, which emphasised that how Europe was organised in different nations, and of course this was true. They were organised in different nations, but they were also organised through transnational logics, and you saw this quite clearly that up till the October Revolution in, in Russia, whenever uh, European powers were confronted by a anti-colonial resistance, most of the times they would collaborate with each other against the European, against the colonial resistance. In other words, in the words of uh, um, the American, African-American scholar, uh, William um, Boy, um, there was a color line that underscored international relations. Whiteness was something which was globally organized, even though it had national inflections. To put it another way, that 
the European colonial enterprise was a global enterprise which was nationally divided but racially united. And colonialism constructed a racial, colonialism is racism, so it constructed a racial order, a world racial order. So even at that source, it transcended the national it, it, by embracing something which is beyond that. But one of the ways that it perpetuated its, its ability to control is to push nationalism among other non-European um, peoples as a way of dividing and weakening them. So for example, um, you know, everyone knows that Africa, I think, has over 50 countries. And many of these countries are very small. Some of them are very, are, because of that, they are less able to defend themselves externally from external threat. Therefore, they are less able to exercise sovereignty. That makes they are more dependent on international donors, et cetera. Um, similarly, you could argue that there is, uh, you know, you could think, well, the organization of the, the Islamic, um, organization of Islamic Conference um, has almost over about 56 members. If all of these economies and societies were together, you would be talking about an entity which is probably have a population of over a billion, which would have an economy as um, probably the third or fourth largest economy in the world. Um, you could see it would be a very different proposition in dealing with a, that scale than dealing with 56 very small, uh, relatively speaking, smaller countries, etc. So I'm not here talking about uh, the uh, benefits or the impossibility or not, but I would note that I doubt very much that either people would be talking about China or India or even the United States if they were divided up into smaller units. They would not talk about them with the same um, sense of their power and their authority in the world. So clearly in the international order, scale makes a difference to certain kind of prospects. So what, how do we then talk about the influence of the national? So one of the things that the influence of the national did was translate colonial modernity into smaller units around the nation state and all the kind of attempts to imagine futures became attempts to imagine national futures. And that nationalism underlies much of the order of the world, but that nationalism is actually um, one of the sources, not the only source, but one of the sources why there remains such an imbalance in relations of power in the world. Now you could say, well, okay, but let's now, let me just backtrack a minute. One of the criticisms often made against nationalism in, in, in outside Europe, especially, and outside some of the society is that it's, it's artificial, that it is um, something which is not natural or organic to those societies concerned. What I would suggest to you is that nationalism or the construction of the nation state, whether it's in England or France, is artificial in itself. There is no natural nation state. There are narratives which talk about nation nationhood, but it's the state that makes the nation, not the nation that is entitled to the state. And that has been the experience of Europe as well as elsewhere. So the construction, we have to think about the nation state as a particular configuration of a political society. It is not natural, but it is constituted. And how the boundaries of that are um, drawn, whether the boundaries are, um, if you want, geographical, but they can also be boundaries which are social um, between how you divide various populations, how you divide various ways of um, various hierarchies, how you divide various privileges. So the nation state project 
is how colonial modernity translated itself in as the empires began to dismantle. Now, this is a very complex picture and there are many people who will say, well, actually the empires, European empires had a preference for having these large states and it's only the local people that led to their breakup, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't, I mean, I'm gonna get into that in the questioning, but I would still want to maintain that the idea of the nation state as the only legitimate form of political community began to be part of the cultural legacy of the European colonial venture itself. It became associated with being modern. It became associated with the success and achievements of, um, of, 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 European, um, of the European enterprise. But it also means that the ability to think beyond its boundaries, imagine futures beyond its boundaries became very, very challenging. And you could say, well, why does that matter? Yes, it is true, but why does it matter? And what I want to say is it matters for three main reasons. Firstly, it is a truism that many of our problems that confront humanity are global, not local. Um, we are now, all of us, in the midst of a pandemic. There is no, the pandemic itself spread across the planet. It um, allowed for the fact that you couldn't say the behavior or its ability could be contained within one nation state. Or look at climate um, change is another one. You, one country carrying out policies which are polluting and harmful can have effects on another country. So the nature, there are a number of issues which are global, which the nation is inadequate to deal with on its own. So that's the first element of that. The second and unrelated, uh, not unrelated element to do with the, um, the limits of the nation state is the one that I've already alluded to, is um, a world in which there are 200 nation states means that those who are more powerful are able to organize and coordinate and orchestrate better than those um, which are smaller. In other words, the veneer of um, like kept in international organizations for many reasons that every nation state has, is equal is belied by the reality of the differences in power. Um, again, there is an argument that this is something that's uh, been learned in terms of um, in some areas. So for example, the European Union um, aggregate is the largest economy in the planet, larger than China, larger than the United States. And now with Brexit, there is a possibility that it may become more and more confederal and be able to exercise its authority and its interests on over many, many other different spheres. Um, look at the way it can regulate the big giant tech companies. Those, they would only listen to about three major powers in the world. They listen to China, they listen to the United States, and they listen to the EU. Um, their ability, so there is a difference in the possibility of constructing large coalitions, alliances, etc., to deal with the unevenness of power relationships. But the third effect of, of the nation state is that the nation state makes splits particular associations and does so by denying a particular historicity. In other words, what the nation state does is very often project itself backwards in time, saying that it was always there. And what that does 
is prevent us from imagining how things were different. Because all we can think about is how the present is really traceable right to the past, rather than thinking about different ways, different forms of political society that have existed and different forms of political society that enable different kinds of um, different kinds of prosperities, different kinds of harmonies. Okay. So, you know, saying what I'm trying to say is this, that the nation state is also a project of imagination. It is also not only a cultural project, it manufactures its culture, but often to manufacture its culture it is dependent on the dominant forms of cultural expression, and it simply imports them um, rather than being able to construct something new because it has a very impoverished notion of its own past. Right, so where does that leave imagining Islamic age futures? If you cannot imagine a future, you are condemned to passivity and hopelessness. If you don't believe me, think for a minute at your own personal level. Supposing you could not think, you would think about tomorrow. Think if you could not think about the next hour. If you cannot imagine yourself tomorrow, you can't imagine yourself in the future. You cannot organize yourself. You, you are succumbed to a certain kind of nihilism in which the present is all that matters, but you can't have any projects. You can't have anything. You can't have a task to do because every action involves a projection into the future. And if this is true of um, individuals, I would say this is also true collectively, that it is important to imagine, um, being able to imagine itself in the future. One of the things about um, mainstream Western um, science fiction is the absence of non-Western societies. They simply disappear. Either they disappear completely, or in the sense that there's nothing left of them, or they disappear in the sense that they may be, uh, you can recognize them as being different, but they are part of the same um, amalgam. They're part of the same future. The difference is skin is, 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 is superficial. So in any kind of organization, and the question that I would put back to everybody now is this. Imagining Islamic eight futures is a task which is not only um, cultural, but it is a fundamental task for the battle of ideas. And part of the contribution that academia plays is in a battle of ideas, not as, as a propagandist, not as ideologues, but in terms of broadening the range of examples by which we understand ourselves and the world. So the issue is this, that if you believe there is a distinct Muslim presence, then you have to imagine what its future would be. And that requires a certain act of faith that it has a future. And the impossibility of imagining the Islamic future would condemn any kind of transnational solidarities, any attempt to escape the prison of the present to failure simply because you cannot imagine anything better. And it is only by hoping for something better that you can arouse yourself and others to make things happen, which bring the better nearer. So the task then is not, a, it's not an abstract one in one way. 
The task is really not to put a two point pointer, to think what would it look like to imagine an Islamicate future is not too dissimilar to what it would look like to ask yourself, what would an Islamic dream be? Not an Islamic dream, sorry, an Islamic hate dream. If there's a Chinese dream in the world, if there's an American dream in the world, does there need to be an Islamic dream, Islamic hate dream, which then projects and imagines the Islamic hate future? Thank you. Um, I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Mr. Professor, for your very informative uh, lecture. Thanks a lot. There are a couple of questions. If you don't mind, we could proceed to the questions session. Absolutely. Oh, well. Yes, the first question, question is about the wars happening among Muslims in Syria, Libya, Yemen. And do you believe that they would like to hear your own personal opinion? Do you believe that uh, that we can share an Islamic dream in under this under these circumstances. I think it's absolutely important to do so in those circumstances. It's very easy to do it when there is no um, conflict. But look, I'll give you an example. Um, between 1870 to 1940, uh, 1945, Europe two countries in Europe, France and Germany, went to war with each other about three times. As a result of these wars, over 70 million people were killed. In 1950s, mid fifties, not more than 10 years after the, uh, 1945, they came together and signed the Pact of uh, a Treaty of Iron and Steel Cooperation, which was the foundation of the European order. So if you look at the violence that happened in seven, those 70 years, in a lifetime, 70 million people killed. Then you see how is it that in fact, the European Union is one of the most pacified zones of the world now. So I think the existence of conflict in many parts, you've mentioned Syria and Lebanon in the question, are an indictment of the impossibility of an Islamic hate future, because they refer to the perpetuation of a nationalist reality rather than transnational solidarities. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Professor. The next question is from Iran. Uh, mm -hmm. the, our participant asking that, he is telling also a statement. Today, of all, all civilizations on this planet, science is the weakest in the lands of Islam. That is the statement by Dr. Abdus Salam in 1987. Mm -hmm. Almost 30 years are passed. Now science in Muslim world improved, but still dismal. Only three Muslim countries are among top 20 countries with highest science prediction, Turkey, mm -hmm. Iran, and Saudi Arabia. While to some extent economy is becoming some in, in some Muslim countries, the wise scientific growth doesn't match with economic growth in Muslim countries. And he's also, I think his opinion that I personally think the challenge is not in the future, but right here in the present, it is the lack of cooperation among the Muslim countries. So what is the, your uh, opinion about that? Okay, I think the second point is a misunderstanding. When he says the present, there is no present. In a sense, every present is already uh, predicated on the future even if you're going to raise a sentence or speak, or when he wrote, he was already involved in a future intervention. Otherwise, why would you do anything? So that's the first point. Um, the present isn't present in a sense. Um, it's always moving forward. The question about science, now this is a really, really interesting question comes in here because the idea is this, that how do you explain big science? How do you explain the success of science in countries like Turkey and Iran compared to other countries? And how do you put this together? Now, the issue really is this, that the arguments which are often made are looking for culturalist solutions to um, science. They say that the reason is because of Islam prevented science. 
But this is completely a, uh, a situation which completely misunderstands the history of what happened. Firstly, what it does is take the opposition between religion and science, which is found in Christianity, but not in the Islamic age in the same way, and makes that a global picture. Secondly, it evades the idea, the role of um, colonial controls, informal and informal, in the production of knowledges. So the idea that science is not, or not important or not there, if you look, for example, at the Nobel, um, Nobel Peace Prizes, uh, not the Peace Prizes, the Nobel Prizes for, for um, Physics, and that, you can see there is a direct correlation between the emergence of a society and it's, uh, the power it has and its ability to actually do this kind of science. Science exists in a broader complex of relationships. And right now I would argue that uh, there are no, for example, there are hardly any universities in the world which are not westernized universities. And westernized universities produce not only knowledge, but they also produce a hierarchy of knowledge in which those who are not uh, who are not part of the westernizing horizon are often only able to do certain types of tasks. So I think it's very, very important not to take these kinds of um, empirical statements. This goes back to what I was saying about undoing without testing their actual, the logic or behind them, which make them the case. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you already talked about the conflicts and their effects on the Islam, Islamic world. The next question is about uh, the European culture and the role of European culture to the Islamic identity in Muslims in Europe. How do you evaluate this role of European culture in this context? That's that question from the Tajikistan. Look, I think one of the things I'm trying to say here is this, that the boundaries of culture are not fixed, but they are constantly created, yeah? So to go back to the example of the universities, uh, universities in Europe, you often have people dressing in gowns for ceremonies. We know that those gowns, you can trace them from the universities in the Islamic age, yeah? Or take, for example, the use of the zero, in uh, many, many aspects. Is the zero Hindu, Indian, European, what? Does that mean to say that we say all computers, because the zero was a, is an Indian invention that all computing is Indian? And these are the sorts of claims that people make all the time. Europeans make the claim about themselves all the time, that everything becomes about, it's a story about narcissism, writing, and we, far as we know, that the uh, people, the Sumerians were the first people to write. Does that mean that all literature, yes, there's no right or wrong answer for this. You can make the argument that everyone else is sub-Sumerian. Or to give you an Islamic example, we know that um, Aristotle was very, very important for European um, civilization, but they actually got Aristotle mainly via Islamicate readings of it, Islamicate work on that. So you could say that both the Islamicate and the Western are Aristotelian. But nowadays, when you read uh, history books or philosophy books, even the ones which circulate in the Muslim lands, they will say that Aristotle is European, is Western. And therefore, they will completely um, wipe out the whole experience that you had. Aristotle existed before this notion of the West and the rest took hold. And the fact that they have Aristotle is only through Muslim scholarship. So I think what we're dealing with is not fixed parameters and properties, but different ways of writing stories and different ways of writing histories. And the task then must be to write a history uh, or to continue to write the Islamic hate history as a way of writing itself into the future. Yes, I totally agree with you, dear professor. Uh, the next question is from Pakistan uh, about the uh, question is how to define the concept of political Islam and Islamic radi radicalization. 
and how to relate them to each other? Okay. Well, there are lots of ways of defining political Islam and radicalization. It often depends on um, where people situate themselves in relation to that. For what it's worth, my understanding of Islamism would be any political project that would center a Muslim um, an Islamic understanding. So basically, I would understand Islamism is as projects which favor Muslim autonomy. Now, that doesn't mean that all the groups who are considered to be Islamists would be in favor of that. But the other thing I would say to you is from what I've been saying, that for me, a Muslim autonomy or the Muslimness is transnational. It's post mudbi in the sense it's not sectarian. It cannot be sectarian. It, is, it has these qualities that it has to embrace the Islamicate rather than um, any kind of sect or any kind of nation. And in fact, if you look at the writings of people like say Qutb or Khomeini or Mududi, you can see that they do not fit these conventional sectarian or nationalist um, uh, proliferations, na uh, constellations. So I would say that um, radicalization is, 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 is a kind of a word that's often used to describe lots of different actions. I think the question is this, that what do you say about the use of violence? And how does that violence, and where is violence legitimate and when is not legitimate? And that's a, a really a concrete sort of situation. But in general, I would say, if you are in favor of Muslim political autonomy, if you think Muslims should write their own history, then it seems to me that there are, that would be some sort of political Islam. And if you're not in favor of that, then whether you call yourself that or not, um, I'm not sure that would be very useful. But with any kind of ideal, um, any kind of major um, discourse, you are going to have differences and contentions within it. So that shouldn't surprise us. Yes, uh, Professor, thank you. And the last question is from Bangladesh. Our participant, Fahmida Faiza, asking that, how much would you agree with the opinion that the battle of ideas have shaken the core foundation of unity of the Muslim states today? I would disagree with it totally. I would think it's the vacuum of any battle of ideas, which is shaking the, eroding the foundation. It is because Muslims, uh, the Muslim world has so little ideas of its own right now, which have any kind of purchase, which is a real problem. I would like there to be a battle of ideas because what a battle of idea means is improving arguments. It's actually giving different visions. I'm not sure there are that many different visions or different uh, ways of imagining a Islamicate future right now, which is Islamicate rather than nationalist. Thank you, Professor. There are, there are a lot of comments as well as questions, and they are thanking to you for this excellent lecture that you delivered today. Well, thank and you. I would like to thank you for joining us today. That is the end of our session. If you have some closing remarks, please feel free to share. No, I mean, look, um, thank you very much. It's very odd speaking like this anyway, but the point that I wanted to make this is this lecture, a hopeful one, and, and one about really asking, you know, the people who are listening as well as to be part of the project, to be part of a solution by imagining, and imagining isn't just a mental activity, it's actually a activity of transformation, of imagining what an Islamic world, an Islamic future looks like, and therefore so we can start having our own dreams in a way. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for joining us today and accepting our invitation. Thank, Thank you, you very much for inviting me. Thank you all. Bye.